Well, hello there, and welcome aboard to another English language A level video with me, Paul from the QE here in Darlington. This one is uh, a bit of guidance and feedback on the English language A level AQA paper one from 2019. Here, as always, is the question on the first two bits of the section uh, analyze how text A and then text B uses language to create meanings and representations. Notice the focus is on language. Don't feel tempted to start talking about the images or the font sizes or shapes. Leave all of that to media studies. Focus on the language features. Notice also meanings is pluralized. It's got an S inflection on the end. That's important. That shows that texts mean different things to different people, depending on the social context in which they are receiving the text. That's particularly important if you're looking at an older text, like in this case, it's from 1908. So the implied audience there is presumably going to be reading it, interpreting it in a different way to the actual audience here today in the 21st century. So meanings is a plural concept. And lastly, of course, we've got representations. Now, remember, representations means a version of the truth, which may not be the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So it's somebody's opinion about reality is a representation. And you'll see that I've put underneath there the marks for this. Uh, it is astonishing how much of the weighting for your entire A-level goes in just an hour and a half of this piece of writing. Because in total, you get to get a mark out, this section gets a mark out of 70, which is then doubled. So 140 out of the total number of 500 marks. So you're getting up to creeping up towards about a third of your entire English language A-level assessment simply goes on this hour and a half assessment. Okay. So it's pretty important that you get the technique right. Now we're looking at the 2019 summer uh, papers. London's most annoying food trends posted by We Are London in 2016. Bread, sausages and ice cream have to be artisan. Anything you can lay your hands on can be made into a cocktail, radish and thistle nectarini, anyone? And everything is either detoxing or a posh version of junk food served in the mason jar and massively overpriced. Here are a few irritating feud trends currently doing the rounds. The paleo diet. According to some experts, the paleo diet is the healthiest way to eat. That's the diet followed by cavemen who lived to the grand old age of 30. Cutting down on dairy, processed food and alcohol is common sense, but it's also a smart money-making move for eager restaurateurs to open eateries offering paleo meals. Okay, so here we've got a typical 21st century text, haven't we? It could only have been produced in the 21st century. It couldn't even have been produced 30 years ago, and certainly not 100 years ago. So that interactive and interactional uh, uh, character of the text is there from the very start. And um, it's clearly presenting a highly pejorative view about food trends. Look at this big headline, London's most annoying food trends. We've got a superlative adjective that's being used that's positioning you, the audience, to feel irritated by these food trends. Notice that the word trend itself is loaded with connotations because it means something that is short-lived. Okay, so it's setting you up to think and feel. Uh, in a sort of dominant hegemonic way where you're going to accept the irritation of the writer. Incidentally, it's posted by We Are London. So look at that, the pride in regional identity coming through with the first person plural pronoun we, the copula verb are, and then the proper noun London. So when you're doing your analysis, make sure that you tick all the boxes and you really get, get your hands dirty with the A01 terms like I've just done there. The uh, article starts with bread, sausages, and ice cream. So these are hypernyms, H-Y-P-E-R. They're broad terms. Um, and really, we've got a comic contrast that's going on because these are everyday items of food, bread, sausages, and ice cream. And then artisan seems very niche. So you've got a kind of comic 
contrast, a kind of juxtaposition of register that's going on, which is actually characteristic throughout the, uh, the entire text. We've got a nice variety in different sentence functions here. Look at your second sentence. Anything you can lay your hands on can be made into a cocktail. Radish and thistle nectarini, anyone? So we've got the interrogative function that's being used here to sort of mimic the kind of pretentious uh, language used in some of these restaurants. And therefore, again, it's to poke fun and to make a pejorative view about these cafes and restaurants. And again, you've got this nice contrast in register. Anything you can lay your hands on is an idiomatic expression with full of monosyllabic words. And then the idea then it's uh, contrasted with radish and thistle nectarini, which seems very kind of specific and niche. Uh, lots of conversational features. So, for example, the third sentence there is beginning with a coordinated connected and. And this whole thing of things being annoying and irritating is pushed all the way through. You've got things either being a, a posh version of junk food. So you've got sort of antonyms going on there with an adjective posh contrasted with its antonym junk. Um, and you've constantly you've got these idiomatic expressions like doing the rounds. And then it's going to take you through these different features of irritating foods and it starts off with the, the paleo diet again we've got humor that's being used here because in that second sentence we've got the mention of the diet followed by cavemen who lived until the grand old age of so that's setting up the expectation that it's going to be like 90 or 100 and then it undercuts it it subverts it by giving you a small number 30. okay so it's very uh, definitive We've got sort of copular verbs being used all over the place here to, to give a very certain sense. We are London. That's the copular verb. We've got, uh, where's the other one? It's, it's also a smart money-making move. The it's there, the elided is, that's the copular verb as well. So a very strong sense of certainty. Okay. Um, okay, let's go through on to the other one. So this is put next to the 1908 one, vegetarian parties, society's latest craze in London. The popularity of vegetarianism seems to be on the increase, at least so far as London is concerned. Society is now patronising the vegetarian restaurants extensively and vegetarian dinner parties are becoming very popular. Titled ladies, our representative was informed on Saturday, are giving these novel gatherings at the Eustace Miles restaurant. The new order of things in vogue at the restaurant has caught on immensely and great crowds daily swarm the premises. Up to the present, the menus have been confined to dishes of a rather more refined and dainty character than is met with in the ordinary vegetarian restaurants. Mr. Miles's idea is to feed the brain, not the stomach. Owing to the large success which the innovation has met with, it has been decided to introduce a cheaper menu next week. Three courses for a shilling or thereabouts. It's hoped to provide and there is very little doubt that this new departure will be extremely popular. Within the last two or three days, some unpleasantness has arisen amongst a certain section of the restaurant staff. The statement, however, to which undue prominence was given in a morning paper on Saturday that a strike had occurred amongst the employees is incorrect. OK, I'll pause it there. Now, obviously, it's the same topic that we've got here because it's about eating, eating out in London. Uh, notice how the semantic field of popularity runs through this like a thread. We've got it in the in the title there, craze, which has connotations that people are going bonkers. They're losing their mind about the idea of vegetarian restaurants. But all all the way through, we've got words like popularity. We've got uh, in the second sentence at the end there, we've got the post modifying adjective, very popular. Uh, we have the collocation in vogue in the middle of the paragraph to name but a few. Of course, the one that really stands out is the material verb swarm, which has connotations of crazy bees congregating. So unlike the first piece, which was clearly presenting a very pejorative view 
about uh, these food trends. This is merely showing popularity. It's not a negative one. And in fact, it may be promoting the whole idea of attending vegetarian restaurants. It's a very different tone because, of course, being an early uh, 20th century piece of journalism, it doesn't appear to be too interactive or interactional. So it's not loaded with different sentence functions. We're not being asked questions or given imperatives or exclamatives. It's all straight down the middle declaratives that we've got. And we've got quite a detached objective tone that comes through the whole piece. To a large extent, that comes through the use of the passive voice. And, you know, if you can identify aspects of the passive voice, then your examiner is going to absolutely love you because we've got things like was informed over here. And let's find another uh, have been confined. There's another one. And it has been decided. So the tone of this is quite detached and objective sounding. And the use of the passive voice plays a big part in that. The passive voice largely serving to sort of depersonalize and formalize the message. So there's some interesting things going on in here. There's obviously presentations about social class. We have this word society that's used in the headline and at the foregrounded at the beginning of the second sentence. So what it's obviously demonstrating is that hitherto vegetarian restaurants have rather been the preserve of the aristocracy and the middle and the upper classes. Uh, titled ladies at the beginning of the th third sentence there. So it's made to appear quite gender specific and quite class specific. Uh, and I suppose the big news here is that this restaurant is now going to be opening up and serving cheaper sorts of menus. So it's going to open it up to the lower social orders, presumably. Um, it's interesting in terms of the pragmatic messages that come through here and the way that this dispute is being represented. Uh, we're given this abstract noun unpleasantness in the second paragraph. There's clearly been quite a rift in the restaurant, which has led to the manager laying off a whole load of people. Um, but what the uh, newspaper is trying to do is, whilst representing the news, they're also trying to sort of downplay it at the same time, because you can see at the end of the second paragraph, again, using the passive voice, undue prominence was given in a morning paper on Saturday that a strike had occurred amongst the employees is incorrect. So it's very much trying to present the news from the viewpoint of the management and trying to downplay the dispute. OK, now there's more to be said because I've ignored the second half of this, uh, just as I did on text A. Let me show you uh, the assessment criteria. I know the assessment criteria is fairly boring to look at, Remember that uh, you're going to get your question marked out 25 and um, you get a mark out of 10 for your AO1, which is what this one is here. I just want to direct you to certain words which are going to be important. Patterns. Yes, patterns. What you want to avoid is just pointing out individual features like, oh, look, there is an interrogative in the second sentence. And what you want to identify is the patterns that are going across the text. If the text has three or four different interrogatives, what are they doing across the text? Is there a common feature or are different questions doing different things? So patterns are very important for you to get a high mark. You also need to be showing that the text is complex. If you sort of reduce it to simplistic labels, then clearly you're not going to be hitting the high levels. And talking of levels, different levels is what you need. So you need not just to be talking about Lexus and semantics, but you need to be letting in your old friends, grammar and pragmatics and discourse. So draw upon these different levels in an integrated way. And the other thing I'd say about that top bound is that you are guiding the reader. You're saying, come on, reader. You're using these really clear topic sentences at the beginning of each paragraph that signals what the whole of that paragraph is going to be about. So that's the way that you're going to get high marks on your A01. Now, your A03, which is about context and meanings and representations, in order to get the highest marks on there, wider social and cultural contexts. Yes. 
So this is really drawing attention to the fact that it's a certain kind of genre of text that you're looking at and that it was written at a certain time, either in the 21st century or maybe it was 100 years before. So it's a window on a world, okay? It's a, so if you can thread through understanding about the wider social, cultural and historical contexts from which these texts are born, then you are likely to do very well. And you notice here the words here, the command words are verbs in the top level, it's evaluative. So you're doing your analysis, but you're weighing up the value and significance of different things. And that makes it different from just sort of identifying features or even analyzing features. It needs to be evaluative for you to get the highest grades. Right now, so here's the, the, the process of what you're going to be doing. And it's a what, how, why sequence I would be suggesting. So first of all, you need to be thinking when you're reading through it, what or who is being represented? You want to write them down on the paper. You want to have about four things or people or ideas that are being represented. Second thing is you want to link in the thing or the person being represented to the language. So how is language being used to represent this thing? For example, through first person plural pronouns. And then thirdly, why has the language been used in this way? I.e., what meanings and representations is it producing? And uh, what are the contextual factors that have led to it? What, how, and why? That's what you need to be doing about four times in your allotted half an hour for each question. You need to be covering a range of different language levels, not just doing about Lexis. You need to be showing off. You need to be showing off that you are an A-level student, not just some GCSE student that snuck in by accident, and therefore use all sorts of technical terms all the way through. Things like deontic modal auxiliary verbs or first person plural pronouns. So don't be shy about using your technical terms. You want to avoid having a sort of generalized opening paragraph that gives an overview about audience and purpose. No, no, no. You want to dive straight into that swimming pool. Don't even get changed, I would say. Just dive straight in there with your first language point and your first thing of representation. And as I've said before, it's about identifying patterns rather than looking at just single features. You've got to move quite briskly because you've only got a small amount of time. But, uh, you know, you've really got to practice writing two sides per half hour, get through enough material. Now, here I've handpicked 10 possible patterns to look out for in your text A and B. And this is for questions one, two and three. So here we go. You're marching into the exam. You don't know what they're going to give you. But here are 10 possible language areas that you could use to analyze. The first one is about sentence functions. Now, there's nothing very much you can say about declaratives because declaratives do a whole range of different jobs. I know students sometimes say, oh, well, it's written in declaratives, therefore it's lots of factual information. But declaratives aren't necessarily factual. I could say something like Middlesbrough, brilliant talking about the football team now that's clearly not factual is it okay so i wouldn't go to town very much about declaratives but i would go to town about interrogatives or imperative functions because if you see a lot of those as a pattern going through your text there's definitely things to say about those things the other thing i would do is i would try and identify some prominent word classes in there which are key to the meaning now, sometimes these are things like material verbs, like we said before about the word swarm in text B. Sometimes they're words like they're abstract nouns. Remember, we know we focused in on the word unpleasantness, which seems quite euphemistic to me. And sometimes they're words like pre-modifying adjectives, like annoying. So have your eye out for particular prominent word classes that you think, well, I can base a paragraph about those things. Pronouns are always good, aren't they? We love pronouns because they say so much about audience positioning, the relationship between the text producer and the text audiences. And the sort of three main groups of pronouns to look at, there's first person singular pronouns like I, me and my, which are obviously sort of quite personalised, anecdotal, uh, telling you information about, uh, I'm getting my light back on here, 
so first person singular pronouns, and then you've got first person plural pronouns like we, us, and our, which is often about inclusion and a kind of collective voice making an, an assumption that the text receiver thinks and feels in the same way as the text producer. So those are first person plural pronouns. And then you've got your second person pronouns like you or your. And the handy thing in English about second person pronouns is that they are both singular and plural. So an organization can address you as if they're speaking personally. They're talking to me personally to you whilst at the time addressing millions of people. So there's always things, interesting things to say about pronouns in texts. And there are also interesting things to say about auxiliary verbs, modal verbs particularly. You've got on the one side, deontic modal auxiliary verbs. These are words like must or should. These have a sense of obligation. So you can link that in with notions of power, like people having instrumental or influential power. So deontic modal auxiliary verbs are linked in with obligation. And then you've got epistemic modal auxiliary verbs, which tend to be weaker force, things like may, could, might. So these are connoting things like possibility, probability, ability, all of those things. Look out for modal auxiliary verbs in texts. Look out also for contrasts in levels of formality. We said before on text A that you, do, you often get humour arising from sudden juxtaposition of contrast, where it moves from a quite formalized level of register to something that's quite informal. So contrasts in levels of register are good to look out for. We've mentioned about the passive voice. Remember the passive voice often depersonalizes and formalizes language. So particularly on older texts, you might have quite judicious use of the passive voice. Look else also for non-standard forms too, because it may be that in a, a more modern day text, you have a greater density of non-standard forms, by which I mean things like minor sentences or verbs being conjugated in a non-standard way, non-standard forms. Look out also for idiomatic expressions. Okay, these are often quite humorous. Idiomatic expressions are the sorts of collocations that people use when they're speaking with each other all of the time. So that links in quite nicely with what we've said about formality or even non-standard forms. So look out for idioms and also look out for figurative phrases by which I mean sort of literary devices like metaphor, personification, simile, imagery, the sort of dirty tricks that uh, novelists get up to, figurative phrases. And then finally, rhetorical devices. So these are the sorts of things that in your good old AQA textbook, I'm talking about this one, on page 266, uh, there's a whole list of them. So these are rhetorical devices, persuasive techniques, like for example, lists of three, or litotes, or polysyndeton, so if you don't know what those are, look them up in the textbook on page 266. Okay, so I would always be marching into a meanings and representations section on the lookout for these 10 different possible patterns. Okay, here is some more specific advice and some examples of students writing about these texts. The key thing is use this word represent and or representation as much as possible. So here's an example of what I mean. Text A, so this is the We Are London one. Text A consistently uses pre-modifying adjectives and adverbs to represent food trends pejoratively, which means negatively. The emphatic adverb of degree massively in the phrase massively overpriced, alongside the hyperbolic noun phrase endless cues, and the critical adjectival phrase overly complicated, combined to represent the dining experience as more effort than they are worth, according to the text producer. Rhetorical questions such as, is sea vegetable seaweed? Also represent the text producer's sense of disbelief similarly baffling the implied readership to share this pejorative viewpoint. 
Okay, so you notice in blue here, we've got this word represent. So we've used it three times. We are nudging our examiner in the ribs saying, Oi, I'm answering your question. So use the words represent and representation throughout, um, and particularly in your opening uh, topic sentence. Advice number two, in all three tasks, so I'm talking about the, including the comparative question three as well, use linguistic terms in virtually every sentence. Okay, here's an example. Extreme language, and this is writing about text B, extreme language represents the text producer's confidence in Miles's venture. An intensifying adverb, very, is used with the pre-modifying adjective, little to emphasize the lack of doubt about the vegetarian restaurant's success. The copula verb is and the adjective incorrect combine to refute claims made by the morning paper on Saturday about a strike. Despite unpleasantness here expressed as an abstract noun, the text producer's language encouraged the implied audience to share his confidence in vegetarian dining. Now, Blue is the colour. Look at the blue in here. These are your AO1 terms. This is proving to your examiner, you're not just a GCSE student, that you have specialist technical knowledge about English language. You can whip out your intensifying adverb. You can identify a copula verb. Okay, so this kind of labelling of things is very, very important. I always direct students in the textbook to pages 24 to 26, because that deals with the word classes of English. Okay, so try and use linguistic terms in virtually every sentence. What is my next piece of advice? Pragmatics, it's the big P. It's a super level is pragmatics. If you think of all the language levels that you're equipped with, pragmatics is probably the most high hitting because it's reading between the lines. It's all about implied meanings. Okay, it's going way beyond the literal. The pragmatics in text B imply that these vegetarian gatherings are chiefly designed for women of a high social class. The noun phrase titled women and the comparative more refined and dainty character connote a largely female and wealthy clientele. Middle and upper class metropolitans of 1908 might infer from this language that vegetarianism is associated with exclusivity and culture. Furthermore, the use of the figurative slogan, feed the brain, not the stomach, with juxtaposing benefits to the mind rather than to the body, might appeal to society intellectuals, thereby widening the appeal of these vegetarian parties. Okay, this is so this is all about pragmatics because it's trying to get at what inferences that people are going to make about uh, about this article. In this case, about social class and which gender will find vegetarian restaurants particularly popular. So pragmatics is your super level. Now, at this point, I just want to remind you, you do have this question three. And in the examiner's report, they always point out that students don't give themselves enough time on question three. It's very, very important that you don't spend too much time in question one and two, and then you only end up with like 10 minutes to do this one. This is a mark out of 20. You're gonna double that to 40. So in terms of your entire English language A level, it's 40 out of 500 marks. You do the math on that, on the percentage, but you know you certainly need to be writing more than half a page on your question three. Um, and here is the uh, the mark scheme. And what you notice here, it's this word evaluate again, that if you're hitting the highest levels on these things, you're not just analyzing and exploring, but you're evaluating the discourses about, and in this case, food, fashion, society, and status. And what they really want you to focus in on is not necessarily just to repeat everything that you've said in questions one and two, although there may be some elements of repetition in what you do, but they want you to have more of a holistic view about the differences between the two texts with big comments on the social contexts. 
Okay. So you're clearly going to be using the lexicon of comparison all the way through, by which I mean things like that. So, you know, words that are showing similarity, words that are showing difference. Lace your response with those sorts of words. And start, obviously, with some kind of clear, short, comparative topic sentence. That way, the examiner th feels, I'm in safe hands here. This is like a driver who knows where they're going. A short, clear, comparative topic sentence. I mean things like this. The two texts draw upon hyperbolic language to describe reactions to London restaurant food. Beautiful! You've got the word hyperbole there. So there's your language feature. And it's comparative, and it's short, and it's clear. That's what you want. The language of the two texts fulfills different purposes. That's a good one, isn't it? Because you could say text B is largely informative with some element of promotion going on there, whereas text A is completely different. It's sort of argumentative and persuasive and trying to get you to interact. So they're fulfilling quite different purposes, even though they're obviously on the same topic. The language of both texts reveals contrasting attitudes from different eras. That's a beautiful topic sentence. Uh, the language in both texts assumes different audience responses. Okay, so start with clear, short, comparative topic sentences that navigate the texts. Um, compare the wider contextual differences between the text. So in this, obviously, the fact that one of the pieces is a 21st century text and the other piece is much older, that's going to have a significant impact on the language use and the representation. Make sure that you address this in your question three. The genre as well. What kind of a text is it? Because if it's something from the age of the internet with all its interactivity, then it's clearly going to be different from a newspaper article from 100 years ago in terms of the genre features. So to what extent are you surprised or not surprised by the genre features that you see in front of you and the two texts? There are obviously going to be technological factors, which means there's a difference between them. Um, so your internet piece is clearly going to have all sorts of graphological features, and other elements that will enable the reader to be interacting. But remember what I said, don't go big on graphology. In fact, don't bother with graphology at home. Leave her at home. And then finally, social changes as well. So like I said before, your older text particularly is a window on a world that has gone, a previous era. So make sure that in your question three, you draw attention to you know, how these texts are born out of a particular social context. Here's an example comparative paragraph. Both texts include representations of customers' confusion over unfamiliar menu descriptions. Text A uses the verbal verb quizzing the staff to create a humorous hyperbolic representation of baffled customers responding to overly complicated or too simple menu descriptions. The antonyms complicated simple position the implied audience to view these menu descriptions as ridiculous. In contrast, text B uses the noun phrase curious customers to describe enthusiastic responses to dishes and delicacies. The consonants, ooh, there's a bit of phonology there. The consonants in both noun phrases positions the 1908 audience to view the new food trend positively, promoting the restaurant to the public. Now, that's the way to do it because you have got comparison. You've got the bits in blue there that are showing here. We are... We're not just having a whole paragraph that's written about text A again and then about text B. We're going to embed comparison in one particular paragraph. OK, again, try to write two sides on your question three. Too many students write two short answers for question three. And some other reminders. This is my last slide, folks. So make sure that you don't just write about the beginnings of the texts because this is what a lot of students do. They write a load about the headlines in the first paragraph, and they forget that it actually there are other things to write about at the back end of the text, and particularly where you get some kind of tonal shifts going on, because you could well argue in the text B one about the vegetarian restaurant here 
that actually you get quite a big tonal shift where you've got the testimony of Mr. Eustace Miles talking about this dispute. So the back ends of the texts might have quite a different register and atmosphere and topic to the front ends of the texts. And therefore, you need to make sure that you are analysing the whole text and not just the beginnings of the texts. Now, some of the students that I've been marking have thought, right, I know what. I'm going to sh shove in a bit of Grice here, a bit of Grice's conversational maxims. Or why not a bit of Yaus's levels of formality? Don't. Step away from the Grice. Stand back from Yaus because you don't need any AO2 theories. It's not being marked for AO2 concepts and theories. So don't go big on any theorists that you might have learned. Save that for other sections. Don't waste time commenting on graphological features. And also the other thing I'd say, this is the last thing I'm going to be saying. Obviously, it's an English essay that you're writing. Therefore, it's mandatory that you uh, use quotation. But don't copy out old sentences. Waste of time. Just fragments. You need little shards of quotation to do, not whole sentences or clauses. And that, of course, will enable you to bring out your AO1 knowledge. So you can say things like the material verb swarm rather than bothering to copy out an entire sentence about it. Okay, hopefully that will have been some use to you. And in my next video, we'll be talking through the CLD section B aspect of the 2019 paper. Au revoir.